Welcome to another episode of Procurement Mastermind. I'm Omid Gamami, and I'm here with Stacy Taylor, who's the CPO of Ocean Spray. Stacy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Omid. Glad to be here. <laughs> so, Stacy, you've been a procurement executive around the block, and in fact, you're one of the very few people I've met who have been in procurement since the beginning, since high school. Tell, tell us a little yep. bit about your story. Yeah, so a uh, quick two minutes. Um, I graduated high school, wasn't sure um, what I wanted to do. I thought I was going to go to college to do uh, international finance and work on Wall Street. And I got a summer job through a temp agency working as a purchasing clerk for a small company that made uh, gauges for airplane dashboards. And I was hooked. And I've gone from um, working for multiple manufacturing companies, whether it's hard um, industrial to CPG to entertainment to a co-op. Um, and I've stayed in procurement ever since then. So I started keying POs on an old like AS400 computer. <laughs> wow. All the way to leading teams at big companies. So you've been chief procurement officer at a few companies now. Yep. So I am head of procurement at Ocean Spray currently, and I was mm -hmm. chief procurement officer at uh, MGM Resorts. And then mm -hmm. I did a variety of um, lines of business uh, when I was at Conagra Foods. And um, and then prior to that, I worked for Tyco International. Okay. So definitely been around the block. It's going to be awesome doing a deep dive on your experience here. So Stacy, you and I have been in this profession for a long time. On my end, it's been 30 years. I think yours is something along those lines. And uh, we've been talking about there's problems that are endemic to the profession, things that just aren't going away, despite all our progress and technology innovations and capability improvements. What are some of the things that you see that just are endemic problems to the profession that we need to tackle? So uh, I'll give you a, a, a couple. So one, if in, in any manufacturing location in, or manufacturing company, and I would say even when I was in entertainment, the, the, the yin and yang between planning and procurement. So mm -hmm. we often rely heavily on uh, putting in forecasts into the system and then them spitting out these wonderful um, supply plans. And then when we go and we look at the supply plans, they don't always take into account where the supplier is, where the where the inbound supply is. And as they readjust their mix, there's often assumptions from the business and planning that we can just, you know, shuffle the board around in procurement with the suppliers and make those things happen. So I think there's an over-reliance on the technology to really do planning. And I really think that you know, they do consensus planning in tons of businesses on the demand, what they're going to send is the signal. And I have seen in every one of my companies, you have to lean in when you're in procurement with the supply planning team and the teams that are running the MRP to really make sure that the handoff between us and the suppliers and the forecasts that we send suppliers, because those go like this oftentimes and the suppliers, they don't call the planners right away. They call the procurement person going, hey, um, what's going on in your business? Um, I don't understand why my forecast is challenged. So I think that that continues to be endemic and we continue to need to work on that like in-person collaboration with the planning teams to make sure that we're allowing our suppliers to be more successful for us. Yes. I would say one thing that just continues to be the bane of our existence is mass to data management. Mm -hmm. So poor vendor masters, poor material masters, and just the fact that it, it's not something anybody likes to do. Like going in and doing master data management is hard, right? You know, setting up the process is hard. Managing the process is hard. And then businesses don't often think about how important the people are that you need to hire to make sure they're doing that quality management, right? We do wonderful things if you're in CPG or incoming in, or any type of company, um, looking at your food safety and quality inspection. And you wouldn't, you know, wouldn't let things go if they aren't super up to snuff. But we right. let stuff go in procurement and as long as it's okay, it's not breaking anything, we live with lackluster master data management. And then we end You're up going out and buying all these different tools and creating all these databases and needing all these analytical partners to do spend cubes and all this other stuff for us because, and we're enriching our data on our own with a third party 
because we don't do good master data management. And then that yeah. also, yeah. And then I would say the um, the 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 third thing is, um, especially on the indirect side of the business, is the ongoing internal customer who decides that they need to go out and partner with a particular supplier, purchase a particular product or service, go and fall in love with the supplier, have all these wonderful discussions, agree to all these things, and then come back and say, hey, can you reduce the cost for me and get me the best deal? And oh, by the way, I already told the supplier I'm going to marry them. And um, so you need to be nice to them and not too hard on them, but I, I really need a much better deal. So yeah. I, I haven't, I haven't, I've seen it get better where they engage the procurement team before they tell the supplier they're in love with them. But I would say it still happens on a relatively routine basis that the salespeople are still really good at getting to their end user community and bypassing procurement as much as possible until the end. Yeah, they're trained to do that. And um, if I follow your, you know, falling in love analogy, those those marriages tend not to work out well when they they cook the customer, the end user, you know, cooks the deal with the supplier. Um, you're right. For as long as I've been with the profession, that hasn't changed, and the outcomes generally haven't changed either. So true. Um, and, and you you and I chatted a little bit about um, in in past discussions about the fact that you know they they think they're buying X. You know, I, I want this product, I want this service, um, and this is what the expectation is. And then it fails because what they really wanted, what you and I were chatting about, is they want performance guarantees. They want KPIs. Yeah. They want improvement in what they're doing today, yet yes. they don't really say that. Um, there seems an underlying expectation. And then when they don't say it out loud or they don't say, I really need these specific performance improvements, they don't get baked it into the contract. And then we may be living us collectively with the internal business partner with a lackluster contract that could last for quite a period of time with no ability to get out for performance. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So let's talk about something else. You, you and I have both seen uh, people who are shooting stars or people who failed. But we've also seen people in this profession who've had sustained success. And do you kind of see a secret sauce for continued growth and sustained growth in this profession? Yeah, so I would say that there are a, a couple of things in, in procurement. Um, I think you need to make sure that you are looking up and down um, the highway, for lack of a better term, making sure you understand the implications of uh, what procurement does and how it impacts the, the front end of the business. So what's happening in marketing, what's happening in sales and developing relationships with those individuals to understand where they're growing, where they're challenged, what their needs are. So one, you could better understand the demand signals that are coming to you, but two, also be able to leverage that information when you're having conversations with your suppliers, especially in a, in a manufacturing environment, if suppliers are doing any vendor managed inventory, if you're co-packing, um, there's long runways and we want to make sure we're integrating our supply chains with our supplier supply chains to make sure that we're both equally successful in delivering to the business. Yes. I think that uh, procurement people have gotten a lot better at this, but I would say somebody who who's very successful in it needs to be comfortable with change and be an advocate for change management and a change yeah. agent. Um, people always say when new people come into the organization, they talk about doing things that the old regime was, what they did was wrong and that what they're going to ask them to do is right. I, I don't like that terminology and that's not what it should be. It should be the old way of doing things was the old way of doing things. And there are yeah. different ways of doing things that could be much more optimal. Um, and you have to be careful when you say this to come in like a whirlwind and I've come into multiple organizations when they've had people been in role for quite a period of time before I got there and got very nervous about the change that they're, you're going to make so you have to understand where they are and help them to get to where they need to be and sometimes it's some are really quick and sometimes it takes seven or eight you know um iterations, trainings, communications, slow movement. 
And I think everybody's capable of change. You just need to understand within your organization and your department, are you able to make that change? And then how are you also able to make that change and facilitate that change with your partners, whether that be planning, transportation, marketing, sales, so that you can actually have a collective um, partnership moving forward. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example. So the, this morning I was on the, the phone with one of our international locations, just talking about how they source their commodities because I don't source their commodities for them because they source in the country that they're in. So it's very different mm -hmm. than the United States. So they actually had a very different strategy on two of their largest categories compared to what we were doing. So um, monthly now I had been producing or having produced uh, an international market report. So it's actually starting to gain steam. Like I'm, my distribution list is getting bigger and bigger. So I'm getting more demand on, hey, could you share that with me? Would love to see you know, all the market commodities uh, because the supplier that creates it for us um, puts um, verbiage on it and kind of gives you a perspective. So it just helps keep the business more abreast of what they're doing. Um, and then they aren't having to go hunt and peck for that information. And then since we're getting ready to go into our annual operating plan, I set up some time with them to say, let's just talk about strategy, how you source, how we source, when to ride the market, when not to ride the market, when you're going to lock up your pricing, how we break up the pricing from commodity to um, conversion and how do we share the practices that we have? Because we hadn't done that with them before. So right. we're going to have several meetings to to go and help them um, and then learn from them. So I think being a bit humble um, and saying like somebody always has something to to teach you and also being um, an advocate to to share your knowledge in a, in a, a meaningful way, I think uh, really gives those people the opportunity to be seen and then be um, d demanded of their time. So, yes. So a few of the key messages I heard then is basically is the ability, the ability to drive change management, the ability, you didn't use this word, but what I heard was the ability to drive influence and coalition building and then data analysis. Um, so, okay, great skills. Now, what is it on the flip side of the coin? What are some of the things you've seen that cause career stagnation and, uh, you know, burnouts and things like this in this profession? Um, so I would say a, a couple of things. Um, lack of leadership opportunities what I, is what I would say creates a lot of stagnation. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean leading people. <laughs> it, right. I, there's a, often often this perception that, hey, to grow my career, I've got to become from an individual contributor, I got to quickly ramp through leading people. Right. Um, we, that's not necessarily true. You can lead a very large invisible project or a small project and having the ability to have multiple people at the table and doing that facilitation, whether it's leading conversations, leading specific projects, I think, and volunteering for those. I think people often wait, well, I'm doing a great job. I should just get tapped and somebody's going to come tell me where my next great opportunity. So I do really believe that um, people have to own a big portion of their own career and advocate yeah. for themselves. They should always take advantage of mentoring programs at their company. And if not work on, you know, adding their network outside their company too, as well to look for mentors, to help guide and bounce ideas off of, et cetera. It's, it's not, don't need to do it in a in a in a in a silo, and I think sometimes people and this happened to me um, do move too too quickly and too fast, um, mm. and then you get stuck. So when I was at when I moved from Tyco to Conagra, I ended up I was there for ten years um, because I was very very narrow and deep on indirect. And so it precluded me from lots of opportunities to look at a chief procurement officer's role because I didn't have direct, I didn't have transportation, I didn't have warehousing. So I spent a lot of time at Conagra doing this as a VP and yes. working in different functions of procurement and with different functions in supply chain and working on a big ERP project to widen out the funnel. So I always highly recommend to people who are earlier on in their career, there's never a bad time to do it. But yeah. the earlier you can widen out, the more the doors are open, there's more doors open versus this way when you'd have a lot less doors open as you continue to move up.
That's a great point. That's a great point. And, um, and I also like your comment about uh, volunteering and taking ownership because oftentimes people wait for somebody to crown them. And I've always felt you, you can crown yourself. You can go and, and assume leadership positions uh, and gain that experience and gain that visibility. But just as you said, do it, do it smartly. Yep. So let's, uh, let's kind of shift gears here. Um, one of the big challenges we see is making negotiation a corporate capability. And in what is your thought process and how in the procurement department, at least, how do you make that a departmental capability so that you know that your organization is mobilized and capable and ready, even in pandemic situations where bargaining power has been shifted? How do we have negotiation as a corporate capability? So I'd say a, a couple of things. Um, relationship building with the supplier is key. Mm -hmm. So no matter your size as a company, whether you're small or very, very big, it doesn't really, uh, sometimes your weight does carry, but your relationship carries more, especially during the pandemic. If you were true to your word, had been with, from them, with them before, or um, we're going to continue to be with them post because it was oftentimes during the pandemic. Hey, I can't take on any new suppliers. Sorry, or any new customers. Excuse me. Sorry, mm -hmm. but you know, and it wasn't like we left them at the altar before or said we weren't doing business. Right. We were looking to, you know, they don't want to flash in the pan. Most suppliers want a long-term relationship so that they can build. So, building yes. those relationships and being consistent with those. Um, I would say is is a, a significant lever to negotiate with. Yes. There are there are challenging ones where like when you have your you know your ERP provider or a, a very large foundational um, systemic technology provider um, that they know that you're married you know you're doing the fifty year marriage right <laughs> you know yes, and yes. so when you renegotiate or negotiate those deals those tend to take a lot of extra work. Um, and I highly coach my team because look, those deals come around uh, once every five years and then you're just kind of renewing. If you're doing a new one, there is absolutely no shame in going out and getting subject matter experts to opine on your deal. Going out yes. and looking at when you're doing it once and then you're going to get married for your 50 years, there's no reason to not go out and talk to some of the uh, the companies that specialize in those, hiring them on for a, I would call it fixed fee engagement. Don't get hooked. Don't get hooked on the right. game chair on a fixed right. fee engagement, um, so that they can help you not only with the business terms, but designing your most desired outcome, your walkaway position, and even opining on extra terms and conditions that you might not even know about. Like we talked about, the salespeople give you here's your proposal. Well, there's often things off to the side that are wonderful extras that you just need yes. to know about those to get them added to your contract. And they are, Absolutely. they by far uh, outweigh those. So I would say being able to leverage market intelligence and, mm -hmm. and supporting yourself with that is a, is a way to get the team trained up. You know, I always say you should go to conferences every year in your space, whether you go to an indirect conference or any of the, you know, um, um, specialty ones like in packaging or um, like our sweetener colloquium that we go to um, because nothing beats being in person with people and dish in the dirt all about what's going on in the market, being able to see the new bells and whistles and other things like that that you may not be aware of and getting yourself educated. You're right. And uh, I haven't thrown out this statistic with you before, but it might kind of shock you. I read years ago that procurement, well, let me start with sales. Sales spends on average 20% of their time in training, whereas procurement spends up to 2%. And uh -uh. so and these are the people we're sitting across from the table. Mm -hmm. from. And so we have to be building our, our capability and improving um, so that we can stand toe to toe and be capable and Absolutely. effective. Yep. And, and I think every, every negotiation seminar I have attended, I even have one on my calendar next week, um, all about everything I need to know about the new ins and outs of the cloud technology providers. So 
as you know, who knows how are we going to buy AI and what is that going to cost? Yeah, I have no idea, you know, yet, you know, I don't think anybody else knows they're, they're some are trying to sell you it or do it as a nice add on, but you know, as a, as a pessimistic, sometimes procurement person, I know something for free now is not free forever. Um, so I, I think there's always opportunity no matter where, what your role is and where you are in the business to go out and learn more about what you need to be doing and spending the time. But I think the leader of procurement departments need to make sure that they're doing that and making sure that that's available for their teams. And then I think, again, to the earlier part we talked about, people need to self-advocate, you know, for going out um, and learning and growing. Um, there's so much free stuff available. If you go on like LinkedIn or search the internet for other things, you can get a plethora of initial insight. Um, I do think from a negotiation perspective, some of the best ones are the in-person or on yeah. or facilitated negotiations because you are put in specific scenarios and then have to kind of learn that skill. It's like saying I'm going to run a marathon, but I'm, I'm not going to train well for it if you don't. Right. So, um, and I agree with you because negotiations from my perspective are really won and lost before they start. And so let's, um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on negotiations since our listeners really love to hear about that. You know, we're coming out of the pandemic, I hope, and um, and we've had so many challenges with supplier bargaining power where just people have felt like the tables have turned and how do you coach up an organization to prepare to deal with supplier bargaining power challenges where there's an unfavorable imbalance? Yeah, so I would say that when you sit down, you need to sit down with your business partner. And I think you also need to sit down with your legal team. So, you, cause you really need to make your decision is, you know, what's the most desired outcome? And I use the, the least desired outcome. I use those terms often. Um, like, and the least desired outcome means if I don't at least get this, I'm not doing the deal. And the business partner needs to to know that, hey, that's our walk away. If we can't get here, that's what yes. you're not going to, there, there's no reason you're spending too much money. You're not getting the KPIs you want. You're not getting the terms and conditions that you want. Because oftentimes things like termination for convenience, warranties for performance, um, indemnifications, insurance coverages, all of those, um, you know, uh, credits back for the lack of performance. If you give on those, and then you, 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 we plan for the worst and hope for the best, right? I always say hope is yes. a strategy, but um, you know, we there's it's always a joke. I can't, I can't imagine in your career, like every time you negotiate hard on certain legal terms, you're like, we all joke and say, well, we hope we never have to do this one. If there's a give, when there's a give and take, right? But there were times when that particularly happens. I'll give you a, a, an example, kind of goes way back into um, the 90s when you talk about, you know, people, the, the, the brand presence of certain companies. And it's a company that's not even in existence today. So when I was at Tyco, we did a long-term deal with Enron for nat gas and electricity. Mm. We all know what happened with Enron. And so when we were going through the deal, um, and you don't really find this much anymore. The bankruptcy clause was only one way. It was, hey, mm -hmm. if I went bankrupt, you know, they were protected. But if they went bankrupt, I wasn't protected. So um, my attorney and I were adamant, adamant if it wasn't a, it wasn't a two way bankruptcy clause, we weren't signing it. We, mm -hmm. And Enron was relentless with most of their customers about not doing that. So we were successful in getting it into the agreement and what happened? They went bankrupt. And so yes. we were a secured creditor during that. So we were able to recoup um, six figures plus um, from them because, of, because we were much closer to the line than all the other ones who got nothing. So- It's a big thing in your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was, you know, um, you know, it wasn't all of, actually, that was the bigger plus, you know, the deal was a great deal and we were getting, you know, wonderful pricing, but, you know, for the first couple of years we were on the contract, uh, it was a 10 year deal and the dropping back into the market after that was hard. And so the penalty that they had to pay us, which we did get, you know, even though they went bankrupt, we were able to secure the money because um, oftentimes, you know, they went bankrupt and a lot of that was, you know, 
um, people didn't get their money um, because there's only right. so much to go around. So I think you have to really um, know which things, you know, know when to hold them, fold them and walk away, you know, yes. <laughs> Kenny Rogers song. And I think you had to be prepared to do that, to tell a supplier face to face or um, on a on a video call that I'm sorry, I'm walking away doesn't really mean you're walking away. It's at that That's point right. in time, there's no more to talk about. And maybe we should just go back and have another, come back at another time. So That's right. there, there's, there's no shame in saying that, that doesn't, it's not hard feelings, right? This is, this is our jobs, right? Nobody should take these things personally. And it's a negotiation, right? So and sometimes we gotta be also not panic when the supplier gets up and walks out of the room and says, hey, sometimes that's a good thing for us because we're like, oh, we got to uncle, you know, meaning we think we've yeah. got a deal that's really, really good. And not that you want to press every supplier to walk out of the room on every negotiation. Um, but you have to really feel good about the deal and really understand the terms and conditions, especially to make sure that the business understands in the event it's bad, how do you, it, it, you're able to get out? Because once yeah. you, you're in a deal and then you can't get out, um, then it becomes this lingering bad taste. You're right. Absolutely. So continuing with this negotiations angle, it seems that our um, that the overwhelming focus coming from training professionals and from the materials out there and the body of knowledge is on tactics and counter tactics at the negotiation table. And there's so much that happens or that can happen, and I would say should happen, away from the negotiation table to drive great outcomes. And what are your thoughts on this? Is it misplaced, this focus on here's what to say, and if they say this, here's what to say back at the negotiation table? I, I, I think preparation is key. I mean, you know, if you were getting up and you were going to give a speech in front of somebody, you'd be writing it, rewriting it, reading it out loud, practicing it and all that other stuff like that. And that's just yeah. to give a speech, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to go negotiate a multi-million dollar deal or even a little deal, why wouldn't we want to practice? So yeah. I have plenty of preparation and so does my team, internal meetings to prepare to go into the negotiations to what, yeah, what are we going to say? You know, what market information are we sharing and not sharing? Um, what information are we asking back from the supplier? Um, and so we do a lot of those what if scenario discussions as a group, depending yes. and, and to make sure I ask my team to even expand who they're doing it with, not just do it by themselves. So use other people within the group or the business so that we can, you know, cover as many things as, as, as possible as we're going. And, you know, having your conversations with risk and secure data security and HR and legal on anything that may be, you know, tangential to the agreement to make sure you understand where their position is. Cause you don't want to get all the way through a deal. And then somebody else like the risk and insurance department or the cybersecurity department or legal way in and going, you went too far or oh, you didn't go far enough. So you want to make yes. sure you're building those teams and and spending the time doing that there's <clears throat> salespeople are highly incented on their monthly especially quarterly and year-end um numbers right you know especially publicly traded ones so mm -hmm. you, it is often good for the procurement person to know the exact cycle that a supplier is on and you can play that to your benefit so Absolutely. knowing you know Q1 of anybody on a calendar year, um, if it's, uh, it, it's maybe not necessarily the best time to buy something brand new. If you're renewing, you're probably pretty good because you're in their annual cycle. I would say pretty good. But for, for some, the first quarter of the year, it's like the bastion of desert wasteland to negotiate in. I, uh, I There are some that I'd be like, hey, I'm, you know, <laughs> if I can't wait till Q4, can, why can't we wait till Q4? That would be some of the yeah. conversations I have knowing it's just endemic that they are so much more incented when they're closing their year to get those, to get those deals done. You're absolutely so I, right. I think there needs to be a lot of, uh, it's just a lot of preparation um, outside the room um, that really needs to be done. And there's away from the table moves that can be taken too, right? For, for, mm -hmm. for instance, potentially pursuing second sources and the alternative materials and 
things like this that can be done to to change the nature of of the the negotiation once you enter and start having at the table moves so i i highly encourage everybody to rp as much of everything as you can and even when an internal client or, or or business partner comes and says i really love this let's like, hey if we know of a couple of other suppliers let us get you a couple of other quotes let's maybe benchmark nice. the pricing with one of our outside partners to make sure we're getting the best deal um but to your point when and i think this sometimes gets lost um, or so maybe sometimes it's even often gets lost. You're going through a robust RFP process. You want to move into negotiations. It's very challenging for the procurement person to negotiate two at the same time. Like, hey, I've down selected to the final two. And are you are you really negotiating when you know there's a lead dog? You almost have to do some of that work. But yes. if or at, at, a, at a minimum, try and continue to make sure in your preparation, you keep inferring to the lead person, even though you might be keeping this one warm. That you are, you're, they're still not the final selection. Because once they know they're the final selection, it's like stepping, we're going from 60 to 30 on the negotiation. You can almost feel the air get sucked out of the room, yes. you know, <laughs> right. on those things. You know, so there's there's that. There's also leveraging other relationships. So if we are sourcing something and a CEO or a senior leadership executive has a relationship, asking them to call and preparing a, a dialogue on what you'd like them to get across to their the other CEO or the other head of the head of sales, et cetera, building those relationships up and down the organizations um, also have a benefit, right? You know, so it's not always the procurement person pressing the salesperson. It may be the CIO talking to the 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 you know the the US head of the the business or the like I said, CEO to CEO. Because that's where you want to have some of those 50 plus year relationships. There should be CEO to CEO, you know, connectivity and knowing yeah. when to lever them is mm -hmm. also a good tactic to take away from, you know, the negotiating table. You don't have to say, I'm going to have my CEO call your CEO, right? right. <laughs> no, you just, you go and you facilitate that, you know, in the right way. Absolutely. Well, this is great stuff, Stacey. And this has been an awesome podcast. I want to, kind of end it you know you're one of the uh, i should say end it with this um you're one of the most successful procurement people i've i've been around and so i i want to know for myself for the listeners what's the number one piece of advice if you were to just distill it down to one thing what do you want people out there to know what's the number one piece of advice you could impart to aspiring procurement professionals who just want to do better who want to progress in the field and uh you know achieve greatness and i would say just be be true to yourself and i mentioned it a little earlier advocate for yourself mm -hmm. um you know ask, ask questions to, i know everybody says the same thing no question's a stupid question it's not it you should be cur curiosity is a big a, a big plus and i think that the more you can express your curious the more people want to engage with you when you ask them questions. And, and I think it helps you as an individual continue to hone that skill. So, the, and the more questions you can ask, they become skills you can ask for your internal business partners, your, um, your suppliers, et cetera. So that would be what I would say. You know, I, I love that you use that term because uh, I was thinking as you were saying it, the biggest breakthroughs I've had in procurement, working with clients, identifying opportunities were all due to curiosity. They were all due to looking at things and, you know, why are you guys doing it this way? Why are you using this material? Why did you assume it has to be a spec instead of an RFP? Why did you, you know... Why are you doing this custom? Have you thought about standard? Why, why are you buying so many different variations of, of the same unit that's costing you a lot of money? Do you need to have that many different variations? These kind of things have all been the source of uh, tremendous breakthroughs. Um, so I, I love that advice. I, ho I hope it resonates with the level of power that it deserves with the, with the listeners. Stacy, yeah. I want to thank you so much. Yes, go ahead, please. I was just going to add to um, your commentary in you know a different way of framing up some of those questions. 
because some people get a little upset when you ask them why almost like as if they were doing something wrong to my earlier, mm -hmm. some of my earlier comments. And so if you can say, may I make a suggestion or have you thought of this or um, I have an idea, may I share it? I, it comes from that kind of humbling piece uh, mm -hmm. a place. Excuse me. And I think people are more receptive to that, you know, um, especially when you're talking to a marketing person, we always try really hard as a procurement person not to lead with price because they're all about how pretty it is and not in a bad yes. way because they're all about, you know, shelf presence and other things like that. So I think when you can make suggestions, it then it's really hard for a person to say, no, they don't want to hear you. Right. You know, so right. I think that opens a lot of doors that way. It's, I have always said the three most powerful words in negotiations and in influence are help me understand. And so yep, instead, totally why you, help me understand. And, um, and that can help feed that, that curiosity without getting the defense shields up. So yep. fantastic insight, Stacy. As always, I'm so thankful to you. Thank you for a wonderful session. And uh, I hope the listeners truly enjoy it. And thank you to you and thank you to all the listeners for enjoying and listening to another session of Procurement Mastermind. For now, goodbye. Goodbye.